And so this is a good transition to Phil's work because we began to have Phil come into the studio and talk about his work, which then kind of affected what we were studying and how we were approaching the project. So this, uh, Well, while well, they're doing that, I'll just start off by saying, uh, you know, I, went, I saw Rising Currents um, a few years ago, and that was very inspirational. And, it, and, and sort of what, what I'm showing here is the follow through, natural follow through, using the work we do at Stevens Institute to evaluate, um, to evaluate all these, you know, great creative ideas um, for what we can do with our future waterfronts. And, and in a city, you know, New York City is one of the ultimate places to do this. We, more than 10 million people in the region, uh, maybe even close to 20 million, depending on how you define it, and all these waterways and islands, and some might call it an archipelago. So, uh, so it's sort of a natural follow-through for us to apply our existing ocean oceanographic model or hydrodynamic model. A hydrodynamic model uh, just means that it's of the water and how it responds to forces like wind, um, the surface slope due to tides that washes into the system every day. Um, and, and so, uh, and just to show that, and, and this is work done with uh, Nikita Stewart's Alan Blumberg, Julie Pullen, all also at Stevens Institute, which is over across the Hudson in Hobo. Um, here's our model for Irene. Um, on the left, you're seeing the large scale area, um, and on the right, you're seeing a close up of New York City region. Uh, you see winds, that's what these vectors are. Um, they're about, that's about 50 knots right there, uh, 55 miles an hour roughly. You see the water elevation and how the tides are just out of phase between New York Bight and Long Island Sound. There goes the storm surge of Irene at uh, the morning of August 28th a year ago. And then the winds turn offshore, and you'll see the water, the tides are still going back and forth. They're a big part of the water elevation, the total water elevation. You see the wind blow, the water level is really low after this storm. So this is going to loop around again. We'll watch it one more time. Um, about the end, you also see the Hudson River here with its uh, sort of, it's hard to see, but it turns red. Here's the start again on, on August 27th. As I said, the tide, you see how complex the tides are and how the water washes into the system. It's, um, there's different phasing of high tide across uh, from the battery across East River. This is why you get such strong currents because the water elevation across East River over about 10 kilometers can be one or two meters height. Um, so you get those really strong currents through that tidal strait, which they call East River. Um, and then, so there goes the, uh, the storm again, and then the wind turns up. So that's what we can play with. It's kind of like, you know, everybody here is talking about the sandbox. You can play around and you can move the sand around, but I'm, luck I'm the lucky person who gets to actually make the water come and go, as I wish. And, and we're, we're even moving on to looking at hypothetical hurricanes for sort of this broad risk assessment we're doing that haven't, you know, ever happened, like a thousand year storm, a 500 year storm. And we know hurricanes hit in prior centuries, and it's just not very well understood how strong they were, what the damages would be with today's environment. But we know that there were multiple hurricanes over um, about 100 years from the late 1700s through late 1800s. There were three hurricane strikes in the New York area. And we haven't had one since. So uh, and this has already been uh, maybe beaten to death, but the, ori the original uh, bathymetry or topography of Jamaica Bay shown there. Just one more point to make, and it was very dendritic and full of marshes and. They've moved the, the channel entrance, they've deepened it dramatically. Um, the volume of the bay has increased 350%. So it's, in most places, it's about twice as deep. And, and the entrance channel may be uh, even uh, more than that. So the, and, and on the physical oceanographic side of this, the tide ranges in, in the bay from low, high, low tide to high tide have increased by a foot and a half. The high water levels have increased also. And so to me, the obvious question is, well, if, if the tides get, are bigger, the high tides are higher, then what about the storm surge? And that's one, one thing we don't know, because we haven't had a real severe hurricane storm surge. But we can test that out. And, uh, and also, what would happen? What happens, uh, so this is just one station where there's a tide measurement, uh, NOAA threw out the tide gates there, like a, um, before Irene hit. Um, so 
the population that's the, the largest population at risk from being flooded during a hurricane in the whole New York City region is up here in, in Brooklyn and Queens. There's hundreds of thousands of people um, within five meters, or even you know, 100,000 people within about three meters of mean sea level up there. So, um, so it's an important area to think about when you think about the damages that could happen. Uh, and so this is the normal water depths or uh, the symmetry of the system. And here's uh, an experiment I did. I changed the water depth to be a lot shallower. Just to very simplistically start looking at what might happen if we restored Jamaica Bay. Um, and this is sort of a starting point. If you want to restore seagrasses in the bay, you probably need to reduce um, the tide heights and reduce the tidal currents that can cause erosion. That's probably one of the reasons why they're having erosion of the marshes over the past century. Um, maybe we could reverse that by changing the, the channel depths. Um, either, and this could either be done immediately with dredge spoils, maybe. Of course, it's a complicated thing to do, but um, politically. Or you could even potentially just let this happen by not dredging the entrance channel anymore, and that would reduce the currents. And you might, you might just have natural sedimentation over decades. So this could be done quickly or gradually. So the result that you have with that, um, um, the, this is just a time series view at this one location on, on Spring Creek. Um, the control, basically the model run um, for Irene without any change is in red. And the, um, the experiment that I did where I sh shallow everything by 50% is shown in blue. So you reduce the peak water elevation of a storm and this is with no seagrass regrown or anything. So we could probably have a lot more effect on the peak water elevation if you fill the bay with, with a lot more marshes. That would, that's a well-known factor to reduce the storm peak. But it does lower the um, peak water elevation a little bit. If you think about it, 20 centimeters, that's pretty nice. If you could reduce storm flooding by 20 centimeter elevation, that's a few decades of sea level rise. So, I mean, you, could, you, know, you can start thinking about offsetting sea level rise impacts for all these people in these communities by restoring Jamaica Bay. Um, it, interestingly though, you'll note that there's complex response. The total tide ranges are smaller. The mean water elevation with the blue line with the change phase actually higher than the mean water elevation with the red line, the system as it is now. So you can reduce the peak flood elevation, but you might raise mean sea level in the bay. So, so and the impact that has on marsh grasses would be more something we'd want to study for. So um, finally, in conclusion, uh, so, my main points here are one, we can evaluate these, these ideas with a hydrodynamic model. And we can you, uh, evaluate the impact of oyster texture on waves in Gowanus Bay. So we can look at waves, we can look at the impact on storm surges of, of doing things like this. We can evaluate these different questions. And so ocean models can be used for, for this um, purpose. And then last, secondly, we can uh, help protect people around Jamaica Bay, um, this one example case if we allowed it to shallow and restore the bay in sort of a really more broad thinking manner instead of just piecemeal as we're starting to do now with these experiments with marsh island restoration the Corps of Engineers is doing. So we can start, um, if we could do that, we might be able to protect the neighborhoods around Jamaica Bay from hurricane storms. Thank you.